church. How are you guys doing this morning? Woo! It's so good to have you guys in church today. A couple quick announcements, then we'll get uh, right back into worship. If this is your first time with us, please take the, the card and the chair back in front of you. And if you would uh, scan the QR code, fill out some information, we'd love to get to know you. Uh, grab some lunch or coffee with you. Um, also, we have our fireworks booth sign up. This week is our fireworks booth week, so we have our sign ups. Um, right outside so sign up we have all kinds of ways for you to help our fireworks um, booth really is a is an incredible tool to our community we get to pray for so many people and meet so many of our community that haven't set foot in our church yet and it really is an opportunity for us to shine bright and uh, also it raises money for our youth department that's our budget for the whole year um, this past year we were able to buy over 230 Costco pizzas for um, the public schools with FCA plus gifts for teachers and it, there's all kinds of uh, good stuff that we do with our fireworks booth. So sign up and help. There's multiple ways to help. Um, kids, you may be dismissed if you would exit to my right. Your left, and you'll see uh, Miss Elanisi back there and Auntie Sam back there. They're waving at you to have fun at your fun filled action packed kids' church adventure. Don't forget uh, ties and offerings. We have uh, our giving station out there. You can also scan the QR code on the back of that card uh, to give online. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, that there, there are miracles in your name, that there is breakthrough in your name. Lord, this morning we are in need of breakthrough. So we've come to the right place. And so, Lord, this morning we choose to align ourselves with your truth, with your word. Lord, this morning we choose to align ourselves with your spirit. We choose to align ourselves with your promises. Lord, we receive this morning from you. You are such a good father who always wants to pour out on his children. So right now, Lord, we say pour out. We're ready to receive. We didn't get dressed up for nothing. Lord, we love you. We, we are so thankful for you, God. We are so grateful for the work that you continue to do in our lives over and over and over again so we can continually get in right relationship with you. Lord, we don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. There's nothing that we've done but it's because of your immense love for us. This morning we come into alignment with that love. In Jesus' name, amen.
rising in this place this morning. Come on. Lord, we still believe. Oh, because of what our eyes have seen. Oh, we've seen you moving. We've heard you speaking. So we still believe. Isaiah 55 tells us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We're introducing a new song this morning, and as we do, I just want to say another prayer. And if you could lift your hands in agreement with me this morning. Lord, today we pray that you allow us to turn our hearts towards you and have mercy on your people. We know that 
your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so we surrender every thought, every idea to you. And we say, have your way. Teach us to deeply trust you. Let hope be an anchor in our life. Jesus, Jesus, reign in our lives today and have your glory. Let my life demonstrate worship to you in every season, throughout every day, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same.
confidence that we have that that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts and your ways are higher than our ways God and we we trust that today that no matter what's going on around us no matter what's going on in our life that you are our firm foundation and we can trust in you Lord that you bring victory into our life we have full confidence we have full confidence that you are good and you are the God of victory full confidence today the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Let's give him praise today. Amen. God is good. And as you are seated, turn to the person next to you and tell him he is the God of victory. Amen. Come on. Someone needs to hear that today. He is the God of victory. Um, you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter four, but before we jump in, next week is one of the best weeks of the Sundays of the year. We really enjoy it. It's our Independence Day um, service, and it's all out here in the parking lot. It starts at 11, so you folks are right on time for that, and you want to come, set up, bring um, chairs, whatever, your lawn chairs, bring canopies, whatever. We're going to provide barbecue for you. You bring your sides, and you bring whatever drinks you want with that barbecue, and we're going to have patriotic music, and we're just going to have a great, great time out there in the parking lot both services together, and Galt with us. So it'll be a fun time to bring the whole church together. So Hebrews chapter 4, 
verse 14. This is a really, really good verse, okay? This is a great verse. Verse 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. That is really, really good news. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16. Actually, you can read this with me if you, if you can. This is a great verse. Verse 16. Let's read together. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Let us then with confidence. I love that out of this entire verse. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace grace. What a great invitation that we find to us sitting here today in the book of Hebrews. We've been studying the book of Hebrews now. This is our fourth week. We've learned that it was written to the first, second generation Christians who are beginning to waver in their faith. And the writer wants them to consider a few things before they walk away from Jesus. Week one, we talked about the position of Jesus, that they should consider the position of Jesus. Then week two, the accomplishments of Jesus. Week three, last week, we talked about the rest of Jesus that is available to us, the peace of Jesus. If you missed any of those, you can jump on our Facebook book and they are there. Today, week four, he says, listen, the writer says, hey, I want you to consider the priesthood of Jesus. Priesthood. Now, now, none of you woke up this morning. You might have woke up worried about peace, and we talked about that last week, but no one woke up this morning worried about who is like establishing priesthood in your life. So this can seem like it's somewhat irrelevant to us, but this was an incredibly important topic to these early Christian believers and a very important argument that the writer presents. And as we dig a little bit today into this verse over the next 20 minutes, you're going to find that it's also, also hugely important to your life and to your, to your faith. So my son Judah, my oldest son, a lot of you have not probably met him. When he was little, he was always like attached to me. Everywhere I went, everything I did, he was attached to me. He was the kind of kid that I'd walk around with him on my leg, right? Those kind of kids. So he was just always there, always next to me. And I, I always wanted him to have full access to me. I always wanted him to feel, and all my kids to feel like dad is there. I always have access. And so we were always close, always saw him, always part of our house. And then two years ago next week, he went to the military, went through boot camp, right, and went into a base. And I went to visit him the first time on the base, and I pulled up um, in my rental car, and there was barbed wire, there was guys with machine guns, there was um, all these barriers, there was booths you had to go through, there was just everything that you could imagine, wired fences, um, and I get up to it, and they asked me for my ID, and no problem. I gave them my ID. This is my ID, and I, um, I said, my son is on this base, and I'm here to see him. And the guy goes, nope. And I go, excuse me? Like, you look like you're 15. The mustache does not give you authority, right? Right? <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm his dad. I'm his dad. That's my son. My son is on this base. He's a, he's a big shot. He's like an E1 right now, right? He's a, he's a big shot on this base, and I'm here to visit him. You can look. The, the name is the same, and he said, no, you cannot go in. See, there were laws, there were rules, and there were systems that created a barrier between this father and his child. This is how those who were in Judaism in the Old Testament, this is how they lived. There were laws. There were rules. There were systems that had created a barrier. They did not have access to their, to their father. There was a barrier between them and God. This was their reality. This was their life. Separation, religious systems. Sure, they knew all about God. They memorized Torah, they went to the temple, they knew all about God, but they did not have relationship with God. They did not know God. There were barriers, and this is what Jesus came to remedy. Can I hear an amen? He came to remedy the distance between father and child, the distance between him and his children. One of my goals this summer is to get deeper into a book of the Bible. This is the 13th summer as the pastor of this church. Therefore, this is our 13th book, and I want us to get deep into it today. We're going to get really into the weeds in a couple places 
today. So if you'll grab your Bible, if you got your Bible, if you use your phone, whatever you use, um, and your notebook, and there might even be a picture or two you can draw to help you. And then I promise at the end, after we get out of the weeds and all of that stuff, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply it to your life. But I know for a fact you didn't come to church today to get a watered-down message, amen? So you're going you're gonna to get some depth here, okay? So grab your, grab your book, okay? Grab whatever you got. Um, to understand the rest of Hebrews, you have to understand this verse, and you really have to understand the high priest role and the system that, that is in place here. So really, if you're going to understand the next probably three weeks, this is really, really important for you to grasp. So you're going to grow a little bit today as we dig into this. So, so I think you can grasp the entirety of the priestly role from this one verse that, that we read. So we're going to tear it apart a little bit. I'm going to talk about some things, and then, then I'll apply. So, so back to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. It says, since then we have, everyone say we have, this is important. It doesn't say we had a high priest. It says we have a high priest. It uses present tense language. Now, I want you to remember here, as we've studied, we've learned that the book of Hebrews was written in 65 to 70 AD. So that's after his death, 65 to 70. Jesus died. He rose. He was ascended in 33 AD. So this is 30 plus years since Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. And they talk about him. The writer talks about him in present tense. Now, this is important because how many of us, when somebody passes, it's actually how remarkable, it's remarkable how quickly it happens that we start referring to them in past tense. Like immediately when someone passes, I've noticed I've been around many deathbeds. Boom, it starts past tense immediately. This is not true of Jesus. It says, since then we have. See, we talk a lot about Jesus' birth at Christmas. We talk about his life, his miracles, his teaching, his death on Good Friday. We talk about his resurrection around Easter, his ascension. Um, but Jesus, it's important for you to understand that Jesus was not just a historical figure that was referred to in past tense. He is far more than just a historical figure. But Jesus is alive, he is active, and he is present in your life. So what is Jesus doing? This is the question I have. What is Jesus doing right now? If he's still alive, he's still well, he's still present, present tense, what is he doing right now? Well, this verse gives us a clue. We have a right now moment, a present activity, the current position of Jesus. This is an up-to-date report, okay? Breaking news here. It says this, we have a what? Great high priest. We have a great high priest. Currently, presently, we have a great high priest. This is a title, but it is also an explained activity. We have a great high priest. See, Jesus is the great high priest. Okay, here's where we're going to start going deep for a minute. So get your, get your pens out and get ready, okay? So man and God, we have a problem, don't we? It's a problem that started in the Garden of Eden, and that problem is called sin. See, God is holy. That means God is perfect. And man is not holy. Man is imperfect because of our sin. Perfect cannot be in the presence of imperfect or it diminishes what is perfect. Therefore, our sin separates us. It creates that barrier that I talked about between us and, and our Father, between us and Father God. This is a problem, and it's a problem only for one reason, because your Father desperately wants to have a relationship with you. He could have just written us off, but he desperately wants to have relationship with you and with me. So God, he had a solution, and that solution's name is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. We find here in the verse the title, the great high priest. So throughout the Old Testament, all you scholars in the room, listen to me. Throughout the Old Testament, God begins laying the groundwork or the foundation for this solution. Thousands of years before Jesus came to earth, he picks a small group of downtrodden people, Israel, and says, you are my special people. Follow me, follow me. He says this to him. God tells them, listen, build a structure in the middle of your camp, and you call it a tabernacle, eventually becoming the temple, and my presence will dwell in that tabernacle. See, 
even, even in the midst of their sin, God wanted them to understand their pre- his presence was going to be and was available to even them. But even with the tabernacle in place, there was still a problem. There was still a sin problem. There was still a barrier. There was still a chasm between them and God. See, the tabernacle, it symbolized presence, but it did not remove the barrier. It did not clear the guilt. Remember, this is setting the stage for an answer, right? He's He's setting the stage. He's laying the groundwork for the answer, which is Jesus. The tabernacle was there. The presence of God was there. But in order to approach it, you needed two things. You needed an offering for your sin, and you needed a mediator. An offering for your sin, if you're writing this down, and a mediator. And this is where the high priest comes in. See, the high priest represented God before the people and the people before God. He was a mediator. He represented God before the people. He taught them, the people, the laws of God. He was a prophet of God. He instructed on God's behalf. He also offered sin. He offered sin. He represented people before God, sinful humanity through a, before a holy God. There was continuous sacrifices taking place at the tabernacle. There was continuous atonement taking taking place. And Jesus here in our text, he is identified as not just the high priest, but he is identified as what? The great. Everyone say the great. great. The great high priest. See, Jesus took the role of the great high priest once and for all, representing us before God and God before man. The high priest was just a foreshadow of the perfect mediator, the perfect sacrifice, which is found in Jesus. We have a great high priest. And for that reason, you never have to worry about this verse. It seems irrelevant to your life because you're not getting up this morning trying to figure out where your high priest is. Because you have a high priest that has already accomplished it for you. He's already done it. He's the perfect high priest with a perfect sacrifice. So what did the high priest do? This is really good. This is, this is a big deal here. It says he passed through the heavens. The great high priest passed through the heavens. Once a year in in Israel, they would celebrate a holiday called Yom Kippur. And in Yom Kippur, all the sins of the people were symbolically, remember it's laying a groundwork for something, they were symbolically brought to that tabernacle as a foreshadow, all the sins of, of the people. And the, the high priest would have the job of sacrificing for those sins before God on behalf of the people. The high priest would make an offering for himself because he was not perfect, he was imperfect. And then he would go and he would make a sacrifice on behalf of of the people, and he would enter into the holy place. Okay, let's talk about this. Again, we're gonna get in the weeds for a second. The tabernacle, the temple. It had three portions to it, and, and it's up here on the screen. There's a picture for you. There were three areas. There was the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Okay, the outer courts had, it had all of these altars for sacrificing animals. So you would come with, a, with your sin and with your sacrifice. So you would raise a little sheep in your home. Why? Because you wanted to understand the destructive nature of sin. And it foreshadowed Jesus, the Lamb of God. So they would raise this, this or they buy this little sheep. We have two sheep over in Galt. My wife loves these sheep for some reason. She goes over and just watches the sheep run around in the, in the field there and eat food. And, and so it would be like my wife, me saying, well, I'm taking one of those sheep and I'm going to sacrifice it for your sins because you're such a sinner. I would never tell her that, right? <laughs> But this is what the people did. They would raise a sheep. They would get a sheep, a perfect sheep, and they would take it to the tabernacle to have the high priest sacrifice it in the outer courts. It was a picture of the devastating nature of their sin, a foreshadow of what Jesus would do. And then the priest, would, the high priest would enter into the holy place and, the, and he would worship and he would give offerings. And there was showbread there, which was symbolic of, of manna, which was, which was provision, prophetic of the body of Christ. There was incense being burned, symbolic of his absence advocacy before us, for us, for the throne. There was a lampstand that was representing Jesus, the light. Everything in the holy place pointed to the answer for the sin, which is who? Jesus. And then they would enter into the holy place that was separated. You see it there, separated by a veil. Only the high priest could enter into that holy place. And in that holy place was the Ark of the Covenant or the Shekinah or the glory of God 
dwelt. And once a year, that high priest would, would make a sacrifice for his own sins. He would walk in past the outer courts, past the holy place, into the holy of holies. And he would, he would go before the Ark of the Covenant and he would place the blood sacrifice on that Ark of that Covenant on behalf of the people's sin. Yes. Sacrifice was made. You got to get this if you're going to get the book of Hebrews. Sacrifice was made year after year, day after day. It never ended. Why? Because it was an imperfect priest bringing an imperfect sacrifice, but it all foreshadowed something greater. Here we, here we go. Okay. The high priest, he passed through the veil to the holy place. But Jesus, he passed through the heavens to the very presence of God. Jesus, he, he, the perfect high priest, listen, the perfect high priest once and for all made the perfect sacrifice, his blood on the cross. And he went through the heavens and he laid it at the feet of, of, of Father God. Listen, he is the perfect sacrifice brought by the perfect high priest that took away the sins. John chapter one, verse 29. John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hebrews 9, 12, he entered, this says it all right here. He entered once and for all. Everyone say once and for all into the holy place. The, the high priest didn't have to do that anymore. The perfect high priest entered into the holy place, not by the means of blood or goats or calves or our two sheep over in Gaul. None of that needed to happen, right? But by the blood of the lamb, the securing you and me eternal redemption. He entered in once and for all. And then he tells the readers, he says this, Hold fast to your confession. Remember, the book of Hebrews is an argument. It's a case to these people why they should not waver, why they should not walk away from Jesus. So he ties it back into the argument. Because Jesus did this, hold fast to your confession. I know it's costing you. I know you're being persecuted. I know it's hard to not go back to the world, but hold fast to your confession. Don't go get pulled back into the old system. All this was pointing in one direction. It was only a foreshadow, and Jesus has fulfilled it all. It is all about Jesus. It's all about him. He is the great high priest. He is the permanent solution for you and for me. This is good for us even here in the 21st century, isn't it? Because the world pulls us and it pulls us and it pulls us. But we have to remember the things that we don't even think about every day, that we have a high priest that paid the perfect sacrifice for you and for me, and we have access to God. Yeah. Why go back? My dad, who lived in the world for a while, was raised in a Christian home, lived in the world, and then became, got saved and went, became a pastor. He says this, going back to the world is like leaving a beautiful steak for an old, gross hot dog. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever eaten a Ruth Crisp. Like, it'd be like leaving a Ruth Crisp, like, beautiful steak for just garbage. He says this, listen, listen, hold fast your confession because what you have is beautiful. And what you have is wonderful. And just because you're not thinking about it every day, just because you're, you're not deep in that system anymore, don't be pulled back into it. Remember, remember. And then he says this, we do not, this is good. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. We do not have a high priest that is unable to sympathize. I want you to notice the language here, okay? Remember, we're being scholars. Notice the language. We have a negative, not a positive statement here. He could have made this statement, we have a high priest who is able to, say, to sympathize, but he doesn't. He says, we do not have a high priest who is not able to sympathize. This wording indicates an attitude. It's the same attitude that you and I have sometimes. We'll say the president, he's so disconnected from people now, like whoever the president might be. He, he knows nothing about us here in this community. He knows nothing about what we're going through. He's disconnected. He lives in his little bubble there in the White House and has nothing about this country. Might say it even about your boss sometimes, right? Oh, my boss, he's really disconnected. Like, he doesn't remember what it's like to be one of us anymore up there in that ivory tower in his own little bubble. He doesn't understand anymore. People say it about pastors. 
Oh, he lives at the church. He's at the church all the time. He doesn't understand the world around us. This is not true of Jesus. Jesus has been where you have been. He's experienced what you've experienced. He was tempted. He was tried. He was hurt. He was broken. He experienced loss. He gets you. He gets you. This is important. Why? Because of what he is doing right now. Do you know what he is doing right now? He is representing you before God. He's representing you sitting here today before God. He, he's the high priest at that time would go into the, to the Holy of Holies and they'd get in and out as fast as they could because if there was any sin, they would be struck dead. So they went into the presence of the perfect God and out as fast as they could. Jesus went in and he stayed because he is the perfect high priest. And you know what he's doing right now? He's interceding on your behalf. Amen. Oh, this is huge. Hebrews 7.25, he always lives to make intercession for you. He lives to make intercession for you. What is Jesus doing right now? He is your high priest making intercessions for you. Romans chapter 8, 34 says, Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that was raised, who is at, is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. What does interceding mean? It means to intervene, to stand on our behalf God, he's representing us sitting here today before God. Listen, no matter what you are going through right now, he's been there and his eyes are on your life. He cares about your marriage. He cares about your thoughts. He cares about your depression. He cares about your health. He cares about your finances. He has been there and he is advocating on your behalf right now. Come on, let's give the Lord praise for that. Come on. All right, lastly, I saved the best for last, okay? Let us draw near to the throne of grace. Let us, sitting here today, draw near to the throne of grace. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. When Jesus died on the cross, we are told that the veil, you guys understand that now, that stood between the holy place and the holy of holies, that veil was torn in to what separated the holy of holies, what separated the common man, what separated you and me from the presence of God. It was torn in to the place that only the high priest was, was able to enter. It is now broken, and you and I are able to enter the very presence of God. It is, a, it is a very dramatic display of a supernatural occurrence. No more separation. Remember, it was all a foreshadow. Why did he put that curtain there? Not just to separate, but so he could split it one day, so he could dramatically show you that you have access to the very presence of your Father God. No more barrier. You have access. No more barriers between father and child. No more barriers. Nothing between. No man that can keep you from your Father, Hebrews 10, 19, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Come on, let's praise him for that too. Come on, you have access. You can enter the presence of God. Okay, now I told you I would apply it. So let's do that right now. What are the implications of this for your life right now? Let's review, let's review a few things and, and apply them to your life. Number one, you have a permanent solution to your sin problem. How many of you know we all struggle with sin, don't we? We all struggle with sin, okay? Even pastors struggle with sin. I am a sinner, and I need the grace, and I need the mercy of God in my life. I am not perfect. You, you didn't, you, no degree that you get makes you perfect. No position makes you perfect. Only the blood of Jesus makes you perfect. And no matter where you are today, no matter what you've done, no matter where, you do, then, what, where you've been, there is a solution to your sin problem. And the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, he will forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. There is a permanent solution. We don't have to find some high priest to sacrifice our little lamb over and over and over again because the perfect lamb has been sacrificed on that cross and your sin can be forgiven. Praise the Lord. The second thing is an advocate is available. Jesus is presently your advocate standing before the Father. He identifies with your struggles and his eyes are on you today. He is not removed. He doesn't in his own little bubble. He's walked in your shoes. He's been where you've been and he, and he is your advocate before the Father. Worship team, you can come on up. Number three, you have direct access available. See, I, I went up to that barrier at that base and then, and then I called my son and he came out. Judah came out and he 
he took me to this little booth and I gave him some information and they put my name in this, in this little book and then he gave me a pass. And then guess what? I was able to go in and out of the base. No problem. Access had been granted. Oh, this is good because of my son. Listen, he put your name in the Lamb's book of life and you have access. There is no more barriers because of the son. You have the pass to get in the presence of your father. You have a pass. You have access. We take this for granted, don't we? We take it for granted. We live this way. 2,000 years ago, they didn't live this way. They lived with barriers, and the barriers have been removed, and the veil has been torn, and you have access to Father God. Will you stand with me today? Come on. I want to invite you, if you feel comfortable, to close your eyes. And as a thanks offering, just lift your hands right now. If you feel comfortable, lift your hands and just say, thank you, Jesus, for all these things. Thank you, Jesus, for your priesthood, that you are the great high priest. Thank you that you are the great high priest, that I don't have to worry about all this stuff. You were the perfect sacrifice. You were the perfect sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to invite you. We're going to to take communion in a second. You might think, well, do I have to be a member of this church to take take communion? Do I have to have been baptized with this church to take communion? Do I have to have a meeting with a priest? No, you don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, with every eye closed and head bowed. Believe in your heart. If you're here today and you say, as you talked, I sense that barrier between me and Father God, and I want that gone. I want that gone. The Bible says to believe in your heart. So right now, just say, I need you, Jesus, and I need that barrier gone. And the Bible says to confess with your mouth. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want to pray for you. If you're here today and you say, that's me, I need that barrier gone, we just lift your hand up really high. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? You say, that's me. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for access to you. Thank you for salvation, Lord. Thank you for salvation, Jesus. We're going to take communion a little different today. We're going to do one more song, two more songs, because this might take a little while, okay? I have the communion laid out here in the front. I have it like that for a reason, because I want you to think about what they had to go through. I want you to think about the tabernacle I just taught on, the outer courts, the sacrifice that had to be made. Friends, we get to breeze right past that sacrifice because it was already made for us. It was already made. So as you step out and you start coming forward, I want you to understand that you don't have to do what they had to do. You don't have to sacrifice that lamb. The lamb was already sacrificed. And as you come forward, you're going to breeze past all the outer courts. And then the holy place that all pointed to Jesus. Because of Jesus, you, you, you have access to this. Because of Jesus, you can enter into worship. Because of him, you can go into the holy of holies. And then you come, and I want you to invite you to get your communion, and you can take it right here at the altar. It's okay if it takes a while. You can take it at the side here. First service, a lot of people went on the sides. Or you can go back to your seat and take it with your family. This is between you and God right now, okay? I want it to be an intimate moment. I want there to be action to what we just learned as you step out. So we're going to do one more song, and then we're going to end with a song. And as we do that, I want to invite you to come and to take communion today.
Señor llévame a tus atrios al lugar santo al altar de bronce Señor tu rostro quiero ver pásame en la muchedumbre donde el sacerdote canta tengo hambre y sed de justicia y solo encuentro un lugar Llévame al lugar santísimo Por la sangre del Cordero Redentor Llévame al lugar santísimo Tócame focus on Jesus for a moment. We thank you, our great high priest. Thank you that you solved our sin problem once and for all. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, that you are our advocate. Thank you for the access we have to Father God. Let us not take it for granted. Let us push into you as we go this week, Lord. Let us push in to your presence, God, and push into who you are. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise for his word today. God is good. Amen. God is good. Next week, remember, we're out here, um, out in the parking lot. I do want to have... Um, um, Becky, if we, we can pray for you. Is it okay if we pray for you? If you'll come over here. Um, so Becky's having to go through another round of chemo. You know that she's been, by the way, we're hoping this is the last one, but the cancer's still there, and she's got to go through another round. Um, come over in that, that area over there. So we're going we're gonna to close, but we're going to have a kind of a, a Pentecostal prayer meeting over here for her. So I want to invite all, all of you that, that want to pray, please, our friends, our family, let's come and let's gather around her, and let's begin to pray for God's healing power, and let's come against the cancer in the name of Jesus. Amen. How many of you know he, he's the present tense God? Amen. He's the pre, He heals today just like he did then. So let's just spend a few minutes. Um, God bless you. Don't forget to give on your way out. But those that want to pray, let's just come over here and let's gather around our sister and pray for her today.